Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to roll straight into questions. And we're going to take our first question from Jordan Bianchi. Go ahead, Jordan. Danny, looking at this round, besides yourself and Kevin, is there a driver you look at and say they're going to be really strong if they get to Phoenix or in trouble? Uh, not really. I, I, I don't. I think we can beat anyone any given week. Um, but no, not nobody in particular that I'm, I'm necessarily uh, worried about. I'm just. I want to. You know, as long as we execute the way that we know how, we we should be fine. It, it really doesn't matter if you pick. You know the four strongest drivers um, at Phoenix, you know, I, or the three other strongest drivers, I think, you know, it wouldn't make a difference in what we, we think it's going to take a win to do it. And to win, you have to beat everyone. So there's not any one in particular that uh, uh, particularly uh, scared about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take our next question from Dan with Sporting News. Go ahead, Dan. Hey, Danny, you've competed against Clint Boyer, you know, forever. Uh, with him retiring, uh, announcing his retirement last week, what can you say about, you know, what his legacy will be, what he's added to the sport? Yeah, we came into the sport uh, at the same time. I think he was in the Xfinity Series maybe one year before I was, um, I think. Uh, but, yeah, we came in as rookies together in 06, uh, us and uh, Martin, Truex, and and other guys. But uh, we um, – it was fun. It was fun competing with him. Um, you know, we had some on-track battles and things like that. But, uh, you know, really, you know, we, we kind of – our families kind of grew up somewhat around the same time since we had kids around the same time. Uh, so there's, you know, always been a bond there. And I think that uh, certainly, um, you know, he was a great uh, ambassador for our sport. Obviously, um, you know, he's very outgoing, very outspoken, and certainly think that uh, he's going to carry on that in the TV world now. Uh, and be a contributor for our sport and be an asset for it going into the future. Thanks, Danny. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take our next question from Dustin Long. Go ahead, Dustin. Thank you. Uh, uh, Denny, um, I'm curious, in, in 2018 with the, the season that you had, what kind of questions or discussions did you have to go through in figuring out how to, what was needed for that team in, in light of are, – are these the – what types of questions or discussions is Kyle maybe having to go through uh, now or may have to go through if, if his season finishes out in a similar way? Yeah, I mean, I think each team is, is different and independent in their own kind of way. Um, you know, there's, the, you know, it's different because, you know, we didn't win the championship in 17 and then, you know, have a season like he's having an 18 or what we had in 18. So it's kind of a little bit different, um, but, you know, with, I think it just kind of depends on, you know, chemistry and things like that. But I certainly think that at any moment, I mean, you know, there's not one driver probably out there that doesn't think that Kyle can win any given week, no matter what the circumstances or what's going on. So, um, and, and there's probably not one driver that doesn't think, you know, the, the driver crew chief combination isn't good. So I think that, uh, uh, sometimes you just have off years. I mean, it's just, that's just part of major sports is you have off years and it happens. And, um, you know, it's just one of those years uh, that, that uh, they got a lot of bad breaks within the 18. Can you accept that as an athlete? Uh, I mean, it's, I, I, look, it's easy for you to say right now because of your place and position, but could you have said that in 18? Can Kyle say that uh, with all the questions of like, should a change be made here? Should something be done there? There's so many things I'm guessing swirling through a competitor's head when you go through a season to say, hey, it's just we're going to have a bad season. That seems yeah, – No, it's not – no, it's not acceptable. I, I, you know, I don't want to make it sound like it's just, hey, we'll chalk it up because everyone has these. No, you, you have to look at yourself and every person within the team. You have to find all your faults. You have to figure out where you can be better as a driver, where you can be better as a, a, a leader – where can you be better uh, as a team? So, no, it's not just a um, – this is just part of it. It's there's, there's no doubt that there's a lot of work going on and a lot of analyzing going on, figuring out why the results have been what they've been. And, and it's not all just luck. Uh, luck is just – it's a stupid word in racing. But um, it's just uh, you, you got to analyze it and figure out where your, your, your deficits are and you go to work on them. And then sometimes, you know, it's, it's how you respond that makes you the great leader – or not, is that how do you respond from it when you do have 
uh, a tough year or a tough week or tough race, like the, the response is the most important part, not necessarily the immediate result. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take our next question from Bob Pockris. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Denny, I'm working on something on Jimmy and I wanted to go back to 2010, you and him trading the top spot and during the chase. Was there ever a point where you felt like this is the year I've got him or was the fact that he had won four in a row so uh, difficult mentally to overcome? Uh, you know, I would say that I really felt good about where we were in 2010. Um, it was probably after Texas where I thought we were really good. I think we won that race, extended our, or retook the point lead, and then um, kind of going into Phoenix, which had been kind of in my wheelhouse for, for a while at that point. Um, and Homestead was always good for us as well. I think we had won in, in, in 2009. So I'm like looking at these last two races thinking, not that we got them, but like we're in a better position than probably anyone has been in the last five years. So that's what ultimately made me as disappointed as what Phoenix did is what, you know, when I go out and do my job and dominate like I'm supposed to do and then have, you know, the fuel problem that we had, it's like, you know, you, you had, you finally had the bull by the horns or, you, you know, you had them and then you kind of let them out. And so uh, that was the difficult part for me is not necessarily um, his intimidation factor on me. It was the fact that, we didn't close it you know that 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 was what threw me off more than anything um and so i go into homestead and i'm like i gotta push you know i gotta i need to get this back and and he's we're head to head so i'm gonna go after him and try to beat him and it just found me pushing too much especially early in that race so you know i don't know that jimmy is from my standpoint ever been that intimidating but you just know you cannot give someone that is that great any opportunity or window he will pounce and that team will pounce and that's what they did thank you mm -hmm. all right we're going to take our next question from claire b lane go ahead claire thank you it was a really good explanation you just gave of what a team has to do when they have a down year i thought that was really great how did you respond to having to do that what was that process like for you to dig deep look at yourself and then kind of get to where you're at right now how hard was it how much did you put into it a lot I mean a lot of work I, I think I really I think through my whole career I've always been a hard worker on uh, trying to get better um, I think that as you get older and even though that I feel like you know you know statistics obviously show that we're I'm in my prime uh, right now, I still, you still have to work really hard to the, the group of talent coming up is always seems like it's keeps getting better. It doesn't matter what the sport, cause they start earlier. They have more information, more technology than what you had when you were growing up. So it's like you started late. And so you have to work really hard at it. And, you know, I know in 2018, uh, in particular, I couldn't figure out, well, why were we qualifying well? And why was our racing so bad? So wh how can I do it for one lap, but can't do it for lap after lap? And just started kind of analyzing those things, figuring out, you know, my restarts and how can I get better on those? And how can I, you know, it's just every little margin that you can find as a driver to, to get an advantage you have to try to go after. And, and it takes a lot of work to do that. You have to sh go through a lot of data, a lot of film, uh, to make it happen, but it's just uh, it's the way the world is nowadays. And uh, if you want to perform at a top level, you have to do it. Natural talent, just it, it only takes you so far. You have to put in uh, a lot of work to to be at the top of be at the top of your uh, profession. And so it took me later in my career to kind of learn that. And, and I think I started to see results from it. A lot of people will give your crew chief credit for that, which is true. He's very good. But I think examining what you did to have to do it, you were no less engaged in wanting to win, but, you know, there was still a big percentage of it that came from you, yourself, and you, you know? Yeah, and, and, and I, I think he deserves some credit when it comes to that. I, it didn't all happen on my own, and I didn't uh, write the ship on my own. Uh, I gave Chris a lot of uh, rope to, to do things the way he wanted to do them and try not to implement – like a lot of people would say what he would always say is that he appreciates me 
being in the sport for 12, 13 years saying, okay, you're the rookie crew chief. I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you need to do or how we should do this. Like you're the crew chief. They, they put you in this position for a reason. My job is to drive. I'll give you all the information that you need or you ask me of, and I'll run the plays that you tell me to run. You're the coach. I'm the quarterback. And he says, you know, what he appreciates is that if he told me, all right, we're going to come in, we're going to put caster wheels on the roof. We're going to flip the car upside down. I need you to run two laps upside down. I would just do it because there's a reason for it. He's, he's the coach. He's telling me to run the play. I run the play. And so you got to trust your crew chief to um, do the job that, that he, he's there for. And I think that that's why our relationship worked really, really well right from the beginning is I never questioned him. He didn't question, why are you driving this way or that way? He just says, I'm going to make the car go faster the way you drive. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change that. So let's make these cars work for you. Fascinating. Thank you for the explanation. Good luck at Kansas. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to take our next question from Woody Kane. Go ahead, Woody. We appreciate your time. I want to talk specifically about this weekend's race at Kansas. You're going for three in a row there. You've led over 200 laps the last couple of times. And if you get three in a row, you make the championship four. How, how much is all this feeling like it's kind of coming together for you? And what has been so good to you about Kansas? I, you know, I think it, it kind of started last year. I don't know. Kansas has not always been the strongest suit. I was terrified of Kansas um, probably a few years ago, but I, I showed up to the playoff race there last year and my car was just absolutely incredible how well it was handling, um, how good it was. And I just, I remember I started mid pack or maybe in the twenties and just drove to the front and dominated the day. And, and from that point on, you know, once I create that good database for Chris to work off of, it seems like when we go back to the tracks, you know, he's, he's made the proper adjustments for weather and conditions and things like that and car changes. So he's, uh, he's dialed in. So hopefully I have a, a, another really good handling car like I've had in, 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 in the last few races. If so, I know it's an important one for us. We could go the next two weeks and really shift our focus from, um, Texas and uh, Martinsville to putting all of our research resources towards Phoenix. Um, and, and that certainly will be a benefit for whoever locks in right, right off the bat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We have time for one final um, question and we're going to take it from Alex with the Charlotte Observer. Go ahead, Alex. Thanks, Jenny. Um, you know, I, now that we're down to these final four races, I'm wondering, you know, how unfortunate would it be for a driver, a playoff driver, to have a positive uh, coronavirus test? And if you feel like that, you know, drivers are more hesitant to report symptoms now that we're at this point. Well, it would be super unfortunate. I can tell you that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think all the protocols that NASCAR has put in place has been uh, pretty good. I think we saw in the NBA um, in their bubble that they had, um, they didn't have any positive tests, which is uh, amazing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that as a driver, uh, you you always put your health first. You got to put your health first. But certainly, um, the stakes are high at this end of uh, this part of the season, and you got to just be extra careful with uh, what you put yourself around and 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 the positions that you put yourself in, socially distancing yourself from people that you you're not normally around. Um, because yeah, it, it can happen to anyone. We've seen that in, in other sports. So, uh, but we also seen other sports be successful in it. So um, it would be, it'd be that devastating to say the least. Yeah. And then as a quick follow-up too, I mean, Jimmy said that, at, you know, after a couple months after his tests, he said that he thought that NASCAR should do, have make drivers do two tests in a row when they get the initial positive. Do you think that that should be implemented at this point in the season? Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly think that uh, his was a, a unique uh, circumstance. Um, I think there were a lot of questions about whether it was a false positive or not. Or not. Uh, there's been false positives out there. We, we all know that. Uh, so certainly, yeah, you would like to see, uh, you know, if you do have a positive you know, consecutive test to see uh, if it is correct. But uh, I, don't, I don't know a whole lot about the situation to kind of be speaking on it uh, because I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't have all the information, but certainly, yes, if, if, if that was the case, I would want as many <laughs> other opinions as possible. Thank you so much. Good luck this weekend. Mm -hmm. All right, Denny, we appreciate your time. Thanks again for joining us. Best of luck this weekend. Thank you.